James 5, 19 and 20 says, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. And that's how the book of James ends. No formal greetings, no reminders of his coming. If you remember, you've been with us, James almost certainly was written uh, as a letter to lots of different churches. So he might not have known specifically all the individuals or even all the church leaders that would receive this letter. And this is how it ends with this final exhortation to love one another well, or at least one aspect of that. Let me remind you what uh, King Jesus taught us in the New Testament, that there are three major commands, and every other command in the Bible is going to hit on or flow from or be underneath one of these commands. The three commands of of King Jesus are to love God, love neighbor, and love one another. There it is. Every other command in the Bible, whatever it is, fits under one of those three. And that love God is this upward love, this devotion and focus and acknowledgement of Him. The love neighbor is an outward love. It's not just the neighbors you like. It's actually the people that you within the region, your parish, your, your, your secular parish. That's the people that you are to love. And to love one another is your church family, your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. So all the commands in Scripture, every command in the Old Testament... In the New Testament, every expectation, explicit or implied in the Bible, would fit under one of those three categories. The upward love of God, the outward love of neighbor, or the inward love of one another. So when you hear James say, brothers and sisters, he's using family language. And then he says, if one of you should... Wander from the truth. One of you, brothers and sisters, and someone, another brother and sister, should bring that person back. Remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. He's talking within the church. That's how James ends his letter to us. So as we turn to this text, let me ask you a question. What does... It means to love one another well. How are we supposed to live this out as family together, as Christians? Well, this text is going to give us one aspect of that. Let me me pray as we just ask the Lord in song to speak, O Lord. If you you don't know that hymn, that's the Gettys. I love that song. It talks about us being formed by the Word, receiving it, living it out. Let's pray now that the Lord would do just that as we turn to his word. Father, help us to receive the food from your holy word, as we just sang, and to be transformed by it, the renewing of our minds, the softening of our hearts, changing of our actions, not to earn your grace, but because we've already tasted it. Help us to be brothers and sisters in a way that reflects the heart of this text, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. James ends with this final pastoral encouragement of all the wisdom he's given. And remember, that's what the letter of James has been. It's been wisdom, how to take the word of God and live in the world that God has made. That's what James is doing. And his final exhortation is to one another. I remember dropping off our kids and saying to our oldest, watch out for your brother. There's lots of other things we talk about. Remember your little brother. Hey, watch out for your little brother. Okay, dad. No, no, seriously. Okay, dad. Watch your little brother to an older sibling to their younger. Imagine Pastor James saying that. Watch your little sister. Watch your little brother. Not just the biological one, but maybe you help them with their dressing on Thanksgiving Day, or help them carry their plate. Or maybe if you were the family gathering, it was the reverse. It was a grandma or a grandpa you were helping 
get into his or her chair. But what does that look like in our spiritual lives? How does the Lord say, help your brother, help your sister? James has addressed many problems in his letter. He's talked about sinful speech. He's talked about disobedience. He's talked about a lack of concern for others. He's talked about worldliness. He's talked about quarreling. He's even talked about arrogance and pride. Now he encourages every believer to take the initiative to address those things in each other. So if, if most of the letter, you and I were sitting here like, oh, Lord, I don't want to be prideful, or I don't want to think of your will and my will is in competition, or I don't want my tongue to dishonor you in any way. He ends by saying, all of that wisdom of living in the world, I now exhort you to encourage in one another. But before we turn to his instructions, let me just ask you a question. Do you feel at all, I mean, you don't have to answer now because you might be saying, actually, I haven't thought about this, right? But, but do you feel some level of responsibility for the spiritual life and welfare of your fellow church members? Like, what level of responsibility do you feel to your church family? I'm not talking your biological family. You're a mom and dad and you're like, I'm a primary disciple of your kids, of my kids. Yes, you are. Or I'm a spouse and I should be caring for how my spouse is doing. Or I'm a grandma or grandpa and I should be caring for my grandma. Yes, 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 yes. But, but beyond the biological genetic connection or the fact that you happen to live at the same address, what level of responsibility do you feel for your fellow church members? Because this is not talking about parents to their kids or grandparents to their grandkids, or older siblings to younger siblings. This is specifically talking about people in your church family. Do you feel a level of responsibility? Or are you just punting, well, I, I think that's what the, like, the elders do, I don't know. Like, do you see what I'm saying? Like, what do you feel? Because notice it didn't say, hey, pastor elders, the 12 of you at Hope Church, you need to do, no, it's talking to the whole church. So, I mean, I'm just asking you what, when, what assumption, because we all come into our spiritual life and church life with some kind of assumption. And the danger is that our consumeristic reality can make us focus on what we're getting and not necessarily what we're giving. And you're just going to see the Bible just slap the, the hand of that over and over again. This is not just your hand like this reaching into the jar of cookies. It's your hand like this giving them out as well. So before we even look at the, uh, the verses, what is the assumption you have? What level of responsibility do you feel toward the spiritual life of the people sitting in this room right now and their spiritual welfare? Maybe it's focused on the ministry team. Maybe you're a kids worker and you work with your fellow brothers and sisters, and you think about, maybe it's in your small group that you actually, yes, we do. We pray for one another. We're providing meals to one another. Beautiful, beautiful. But it's worth thinking about that. And now let me ask you another question, but I'm going to let God answer it. What would God say? Like before we even look at another text, what would God say your responsibility is to your brothers and sisters in Christ? He actually shows us early on I didn't put the text in your notes, and you don't even need to turn there. I'll just remind you of the story. It's in the book of Genesis, chapter 4. There were two brothers, Cain and Abel. There weren't two brothers for long, to be honest with you. If you know the biblical story, Cain killed his brother Abel in jealousy. Now, beyond all the details of that and why, there's a fascinating moment in verse 9 of Genesis 4, where the text says this, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother, Abel? Where is your brother, Abel? Why is God asking that? And here's what, what he said, what Cain says. 
I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? There is no way you can read that without assuming that that was actually the wrong answer. <laughs> like We've talked about this before, church family. Every time God asks a question, it's loaded. When he asks a question, he's not joking around. It is clear in that point that that answer is the reverse of what it should be. You are your brother's keeper. Okay, now think of that in the context of those opening, verse, uh, opening words of our verse today. <coughs> My brothers and sisters. So here's the text. Verse 19. If one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring the, that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the air of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Let's look closely at verse 19. James is concerned that our brothers and sisters would wander from the truth. What does he mean by that? Well, truth is not referring merely to what you know. It's not a, it's not a confusion of ideas thing. It's not referring merely to Christian doctrine in the narrow sense. But it refers in the Bible more broadly to all that is involved in knowing and understanding the gospel. All that is involved. So it's not just knowing the gospel, it's understanding the gospel, it's living the gospel out. In the Bible, truth is something we do as much as it is something we believe. Did you hear that? Because I guess, I think for us, we hear the word truth, it's, it's like a knowledge, thing. It's, a, it's like an examination, it's like an essay test. In the Bible, truth is lived, not just known. Truth is something we do as much as it is something we believe. Again, remember James chapter 2. If any book has taught us this, it's James. When he's talking about Faith and works. And he's trying to say it's lived out. And then he even says at one point in James 2, even the demons believe, like they know the truth. If it was just about knowing, there'd be no difference between a child of God and a, de and a demon. <clears throat> and then that word wander, not just truth, but wander from the truth. Wander is not referring to to unconscious departure, like, like the time I was in Yosemite with my younger son on my shoulders and I completely got turned around. Bad move, not recommended. I still don't know directions. But that was like an unconscious, it's not like I was like, I'm going to get lost on purpose. No, th th that's kind of, when you hear the word wander, you can think of like a not thinking, wayward kind of way. In the Bible, wandering refers to deviation from the way of righteousness. The Greek word there is not some unconscious departure. Oops, I didn't realize I was swerving off the road. And then you <laughs> recorrect. It's an intentional habit of not caring. It's any willful departure, large or small, from the ways of Christ. So, so picture the person, the one who has wandered from the truth, is somebody who has stopped taking Jesus seriously. They've stopped taking Christianity seriously. They know the truth. It's not like they couldn't pass the exam, but it no longer is part of their priorities. And what does that look like? Again, if you were in a small group right now and I asked that question, there was eight to 12 of us sitting around a circle. You could name out a ton of examples. They stopped showing up at church. They stop caring about other things. They start choosing to live in ways that are clearly opposed in God's word, clearly unhealthy for them in physical and spiritual ways. They just don't care about that anymore. It's not that they don't know. It's that they don't care. If one of you should wander from the truth and someone should Bring that person back. What does that mean? It simply is referred to help them return afresh to God. Help them return to the life of discipleship. Help them return to their spiritual family, the church. 
But that's what they should do. So picture the scene. Picture somebody. Maybe someone comes to mind right now. Maybe you've got adult children and they come to mind. Or adult grandchildren. Maybe you can think of people that once were regularly with us and now they just don't really do church stuff anymore. Do you talk to them? How do you? How do you bring it up? What's it look like? Well, at least we should feel what verse 19 is saying. Christian, you are your brother's keeper and your sister's keeper in the Lord. Genesis 4-9, the answer that was given by Cain was wrong. When he said, am I my brother's keeper? The Lord was implying, yes, you are. And he has been to this day. Now, what's interesting is verse 20. He does, James doesn't give a lot in, in explanation. He doesn't give a lot in application. He gives us this kind of general principle that's pulling from elsewhere in Scripture. He says, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the air of their way will save them from death, that's, that's loaded, and cover over a multitude of sins. He reminds his readers of a theme the Bible mentions in several other places, dealing with sin. The language of save them from death is a little stark. It's actually, here's a big E word, it's actually eschatological language. It's talking about the end of days. Like when you, when you remove somebody from a path of error and bring them back into the fold, you're saving them from the day of judgment. So like he, he's not even talking about, well, they're just life is fuller in Christ and all the other benefits, temporary benefits that we have as living faithfully in Jesus. He's just simply saying, if they walk away from Christ, they are now recipients, potentially, of his eschatological doom. Okay, not that the one person saves another, but that a person can help another person in an area of weakness to aid them to return and to be faithful to God. But that final phrase is interesting. Not only will save them from death, but cover over a multitude of sins. The language is actually hard to know. Is it talking about, is the, is the cover over a multitude of sins referring to the sinner or the converter? Is it talking about the person who is sinning or is it talking about the person who is trying to retrieve the sinner? The Bible actually speaks to both even if it is likely that the sinner is maybe the primary topic of that last statement, clearly the sinner who returns is saved from sinful practices or even a life filled with the consequences of sin. But the Bible regularly, I want you to hear this this morning, the Bible regularly wants us to see the need to minister to one another, especially in regard to sin. The Bible in numerous places says, you are your brother's keeper in regard to they're wandering from the truth. Let me give you a few examples. The Lord promises Ezekiel, the prophet, that he will save his life if he is faithful in warning people of the danger of judgment. And God basically says in Ezekiel 3, you want to save your own life? Pursue the saving of theirs. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 that he will save both himself and his hearers if he takes heed to Paul and his teachings. But notice that. Paul didn't say to Timothy, you will save your hearers if they respond to the gospel message that I am saying. He actually says, Timothy, you'll be saving yourself too. Like there's some responsibility in that case of a pastor elder to deal with the sin in someone's life. The blessing given to Christians who faithfully and obediently minister to one another is not a reward, but the avoidance of God's judgment. I know that sounds harsh and strong, but I want you to hear that this morning. The idea that God will treat us as we treat others is inescapable in Scripture. We are our brother's keeper. Examples abound. Matthew 6. For if you forgive other people who, 
when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive yours. That's pretty harsh. How about the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18? Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how, Jesus is speaking here, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. Or James 2, to keep it closer to home. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not himself been merciful. So do you hear James' concern that you should be your brother's keeper? It doesn't mean that your salvation, by the way, and your relationship to God is based entirely on your response. That would be a works-based righteousness. It's simply to say God expects, he commands, not just love him, not just love neighbor, he commands love one another. And you are commanded, expected, to be your brother's and sister's keeper. So do you hear James' concern that you show real interest in the spiritual life of your Christian family? So let me get back to that earlier question. How often are you concerned with the spiritual life and welfare of the brothers and sisters sitting around you now? What was your answer before we looked at these two verses? What should your answer be? So what's it look like? Let me end with this. What does it look like to take these verses seriously? Let me give you three applications. First, a general one. In a general way, these verses teach Christians to be involved in one another's life. You cannot do this unless you are intimately involved in one another's life, like in your family where you know someone so well, you actually know their, the motivations of their heart, their bodily postures. You can assume how they will react in a particular situation because you know them so well. You need to be involved. Even in a simple way of gathering on the Lord's day is one way of interconnecting, talking, fellowshipping, learning, inviting someone over for a meal, being involved in someone's life. It's not a judging with false authority. It's not trying to get the goods on their spiritual life. It's not being, having a critical spirit steered by pride. All of those misappropriations of investing in brothers and sisters are just sinning in different ways but literally loving and concern, having concern for them. It is iron, iron sharpening iron. It is being involved. Here are some ways. One primary way that the Bible would hit at in numerous ways would be becoming a member of a local church. That you commit yourself to a local body just as a local body commits itself to you. Membership is a very biblical thing. The word is never mentioned in the Bible, but its practices and procedures and purposes hit almost every text that talk about the relationship and roles between brothers and sisters. Just stepping toward church membership, having a role in the church governance of a congregational church, voting in key members, serving in key capacities is a huge step to take serious. This love one another command displayed in James 5, 19 to 20. Another would be getting involved in a small group. There's no way. You don't even know everyone's name in the room, let alone second service. You might not even know all your cousins' names. Hopefully you know your grandkids' names. But if you have a group of 10 to 12 people, 
that you regularly get together with, that you hold accountable in key ways, that you know and love, you live this out. It might be just your involvement. If you're, if you're a, a young person, your involvement in a youth group. Or your involvement even if you're a little kid in your kid's ministry. It's not just moms and dads or grandmas and grandpas. It's not, ministry is not just for adults at all. Jesus, with the, with the feeding of a multitude of people, was more than happy to use a little boy to help him out. He could have chosen from anybody who brought a lunch sack. He chose a little boy to communicate that even little boys and girls can serve the Lord. Because honestly, even moms and dads are described as children who are serving their father. So think about just your involvement in a local youth group. You're just, you're just there. You're, making, you're not just a consumer, and you're, and you're leaving when it's over. You're, you're literally ministering to all these people, all these kids, many of whom are hurting or struggling, many who don't know many friends. Think of the ministry a high school student can have with a ton of little... Annoying middle schoolers. Just think of the ministry. Uh, my, my older boys had two younger cousins with them for a few days. I, I literally think my boys turned into jungle gyms for about 72 hours. And they did beautifully. And I said to them at the end, I never said one word, there, but I said, well done. Because I know that can be annoying when you are literally climbed on for 72 hours. But if you watch a little eight-year-old boy and then an 11-year-old boy look at two big high school or well, actually one college boy, they are, it was joy for them. And that is your job. You didn't get to hang out with a bunch of college kids or high school kids. You, hang out, you hung out with your nephews. Well done. That's what you're supposed to do. And when they left and they grabbed your leg because they love you so much, it's beautiful. Even if you're not too sad to see them go. <laughs> Just imagine that in a youth group, in a youth ministry. Imagine not being a consumer. So these verses teach Christians to be involved in one another's life. Here's a second. This, this would be a more formal way. In a more formal way, these verses show the importance of church discipline. If you and I are not dealing with the sin in one another's life, we're sinning against the Lord. By the way, did you know that the word discipline is the same root word for the word disciple? A disciple is one who aligns their life to the master, to their teacher, to their Lord. And discipline is the rigidity and the firmness of training yourself. Think of an athlete training him or herself. What they eat, how much they sleep, lifting, running, all of the exercises they do to align their bodies to perform in a certain way. That takes work, but it's not bad work. It's not even really negative. It's just bodily forming. Think of discipline as part and parcel of what it means to be a disciple. Now, again, when we think of church discipline, we probably think of like the, 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 these cosmic removal of someone from fellowship or hating. No, church discipline is not shaming. It's not even excluding. It's not, we're not, we're not Amish. It's actually the goal of church discipline is restoration. So when you have to pull two siblings to the side or talk to one sibling because the other one is fighting with his brother, it's not like, hey, that was it. I mean, I heard what you said to your brother at dinner. You're out of the family. Like, no, of course not. The goal is what? Go talk to your sibling. Go say you're sorry. What is the goal? Restoration. It is not shaming. It's not, well, I heard what you said, so now I'm just going to rip on you for five minutes. No. It is, son, daughter, is that the way you want to talk? Is that the way you should talk? Does that honor our Lord at all? Let us go reunite. Let us go restore. It's beautiful. 
And to be honest, it's necessary. If it happens in the biological family, does it not need to happen in the spiritual family? Last thing, last application. These verses are expecting Christians to have big conversations with a wandering Christian, right? That's part of it. Like there should be people that have just pulled away that you're like, hey, Tom or Bob or or Samantha, let's go meet with him or her. Let's sit down or I'm going to take him or her out to lunch. I'm worried about them. But it also can include many kinds of small conversations about the life and practices of the Christian faith. Little things. So, So in essence, hard conversations are part of the Christian life. But to be honest, every one of us needs friends that James is describing in these verses. You know how many times Christians have spoken in my life in my almost 49 years of life? How many people in this very church have said, ah, you sounded a little harsh there, did I? Yeah. Or don't forget to do this. Or, hey, have you reached out to so-and-so? How many times my wife, in almost 25 years of marriage, has said, did you, did you want to say that to your kid? Uh, I think the answer should be no. <laughs> or remember, grace, gentle, good word. I, I told you the story of my college roommate, a farmer in north-central Kansas. I know I'm getting close to his house when not only the paved roads end, but even the gravel roads just turn to dirt, then I'm almost there. And that brother, when we were in college, at some point, just as roommates living in a suite, there were eight of us in the suite with like a shared bathroom, a little common room when we were in undergrad. Pretty sure it was my sophomore year. He was a, he was a football player too, an outside linebacker, so a tough farm kid, youngest of four brothers, which means he was the toughest of them all. And he, he, was, he was not afraid to get into my six foot four face and tell me if I did something wrong. And it was, he, here's the thing, I knew he loved me. I knew he loved me. He wasn't a jerk. He actually kind of stuck to his own business in a good way, a bit more introverted in ways. But when he saw me speak inappropriately to a young man named Matt Armstrong, I'll never forget it because I remember exactly what I said. <laughs> Because I was a jerk and a cocky with this guy who was annoying. (laughs) He pushed me in our room and grabbed me by the collar and looked me in the face and called me out. And for a second, there was a little flare in my 20-year-old self wanting to shove him back against the wall. But I didn't. And I saw the hurt inside him, not a rage like he wanted to beat me up but a disappointment. And he called me out. And I calmed down and he left because I could tell he was emotional and later that day walked back in the room and sat down and said, what what do you see? And he told me. That was the first of three times in our moving close to 30 year friendship that he has spoken to my life in numerous ways. And what we're going through as a family on Thanksgiving Day, who's texting me at 8.30 in the morning? A guy from Kansas who's out milking cows, reminding me he's praying for me and our family at Thanksgiving. Now that is a brother I need. To be honest, that's a brother you need. Or get this, that's a brother or a sister that the people in your life need. And you might be that person. So hear this exhortation, this last word from the Apostle James to the church in his letter. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. That may be that somebody in your life needs that kind of a brother or sister. 
It may be that you at times, present, past, or future, have needed or will need someone to do that. Imagine if it was your children or grandchildren who live far away from you. And then there's a man or a woman who sees them, loves them, who doesn't judge, who doesn't gossip, who sees a behavior and pursues them, loves them, maybe like me, grabs them by the collar and says, what is that? Oh, what a beautiful church this would be. What a beautiful church it is, because I know it happens here. But let's honor James' word today. Let's pray. Father, you are such a good God to us. And we're learning that love has the best interest of the other in mind. It's not a judging. It's not a holding over. It's not a rubbing in the face. It is compassionate and kind. It pursues the good of the other. Lord, we want to be those kind of siblings. And Lord, some of us need those kind of siblings in our lives or in the lives of our children and grandchildren. Lord, make us a church that reflects this. Not not a gossip. Not a laughing. Not a judging. But a pursuing for health, for flourishing. Help that to be us. Of all the wisdom that this book proclaims, thank you that it ends reminding us to love one another well. And as life is difficult, and there's lots of hurts, and there's lots of brokenness, and there's lots of sin that will not stop decaying away our bodies, our relationships, and our world, help us to follow the example that James sets for us in these verses. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.